The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Securing your recycling in a few steps is simple, like bundling your cardboard separately. These bundles can act as a lid for your blue box or placing heavier items such as magazines on top of papers with no material above the rim. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talk Politics. I'm Deborah Hutchison in the Rogers TV studio. Joining us this week via video is Whitby MP Ryan Turnbull. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm good. A little bit tired this morning, but uh, I'm, I'm doing well. My family is home here and self-isolating uh, with everybody else, and it's challenging times, but, uh, yeah, we're getting through it. Uh, so we are taping this on Wednesday, May the 13th. You just had a very, very long night. You were up, um, I guess, finessing, fine-tuning, going over the final report on virtual parliament. Let's talk about that for a second. Is that going to be the new norm? Well, I mean, there's a very good possibility it will be the norm for um, a period of time that's, you know, we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last and how many waves we're going to get. Um, but certainly it, uh, it seems like um, Parliament and members of Parliament uh, should be following the public health advice um, that, that everybody else is being asked to follow. So um, to date, uh, you know, we've had many, I think it's eight uh, meetings to date uh, for the standing committee. It's, uh, it's called PROC for short, but it's the Parliamentary Procedure and House Affairs uh, Standing Committee for the House of Commons. I'm uh, happy to say I'm on that committee and we've been studying virtual parliament for uh, a number of weeks now and our report is due this Friday to uh, to be tabled in the House. So is it long overdue that we modernize parliament? Well, I mean, I believe, you know, parliament has, uh, and this particular committee in the last uh, parliament, um, uh, the 42nd parliament, it, it, um, it actually reviewed things like uh, electronic voting and remote voting and you know, creating a more family-friendly environment uh, for members of parliament, et cetera. Um, I think there's multiple opportunities to look at this uh, pandemic as an opportunity to consider modernizing uh, the procedures of parliament. Uh, this pandemic is something that none of us completely anticipated, uh, and it's presented very uh, specific kinds of challenges, i.e. Uh, not being in the same physical space and having a virus um, that uh, can live on surfaces for two or three days um, for there to be asymptomatic spread uh, of this virus. It, it really presents uh, quite a few challenges. Uh, it's not visible, um, and, you know, so for parliamentarians to be going back to the House of Commons, uh, there's more risk of them being in the same physical space to their health and safety uh, and the health and safety of other staff members that support uh, parliamentary proceedings. Um, and there's more risks associated with being in the same physical space, uh, much less risk, of course, associated with, uh, with operating virtually. So we're looking at all kinds of opportunities to uh, to operate virtually. And to date, we've had, you know, multiple um, meetings, all of our standing committees uh, that have been operating. Uh, I'm on two of them and they've been uh, they've been operating virtually using the Zoom platform. And I actually think uh, it's gone quite well. Uh, the last thing I'll say, Deborah, is. 309 MPs uh, participated in the special committee uh, studying the COVID-19 uh, response. And uh, this is a special committee of all members of parliament uh, that's been um, uh, struck or, yeah, struck or formed. And um, uh, I would say the first meeting was almost seamless. There was minor technological glitches, but other than that, um, I think we can operate virtually. You know, when you think of operating virtually, very different, I guess, feel to the meetings because when you're in Parliament, everybody's talking over everybody and everybody's, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, yelling and, and 
as I said, talking yeah. over everyone. You can't do that when it's virtually virtual meetings. Does that really yeah, heck, change heckling the whole is field? A real yeah, yeah. Sorry to cut you off, Deborah. Yeah, heckling is a real problem in in the House of Commons. I was uh, really taken back uh, being a newly elected MP when when the when Parliament uh, started sitting, uh, and I you know witnessed just just how much heckling is going on, um, you know, and so and this has been a challenge uh, for quite some time. That's been discussed is how to really uh, regulate this with virtual Parliament. We get almost zero heckling because, of course. Um, we, the Speaker of the House has control uh, over the microphones. Uh, so they can, uh, you know, uh, basically mute microphones and essentially one person talks at a time and the camera always focuses on the one person that's speaking. Uh, so if someone interrupted or started to heckle, uh, the camera would automatically shift to them and they, and they would, in a sense, kind of be outed. Um, which I think is is actually a real positive um, thing. You know, we talk a lot about parliamentary privilege. There's uh, rights and immunities and privileges that parliamentarians uh, uh, have, and they're essential to our democracy. And I think it's, um, you know, it, from my perspective as a new MP, heckling in the House is an intimidation, fa you know, tactic. And it, uh, it makes many parliamentarians feel uncomfortable speaking openly and expressing themselves fully and advocating for their constituents effectively in the House of Commons. So I think virtual parliament has some real positives to it. You know, um, so you are operating virtually, your staff is operating virtually, your office, constituency office is obviously closed. Um, yeah. You know, but we've talked about this before you and your staff, you feel, are busier than ever. Yeah, we couldn't be busier. I mean, um, you know, as you said, I was up till uh, almost 5 o'clock in the morning working on uh, this uh, standing committee report that's going to the House this Friday. Uh, my staff are equally working around the clock. I'm getting emails up till 11, 12 o'clock at night, and my staff are, you know, working all kinds of hours. Uh, you know, we're getting a massive influx, uh, of course, of many concerns that constituents have. Many people are experiencing anxieties uh, and fears uh, due to this pandemic and are concerned about their financial well-being, their health, um, uh, how to help other community members. Uh, they're concerned about vulnerable populations, and the list goes on and on and on. So there's all of that work that we would normally do in the constituency office, which is to support community members accessing some of the financial supports and programs and measures that we've launched as part of the response to COVID-19. Um, so there's all of that work. And then Parliament is actually up and working uh, and functioning on the legislative front as well. Uh, so, you know, I'm on two standing committees. So. You've got four um, three-hour virtual meetings a week there with all the prep work and pre-meetings uh, and all of the, the briefings and, and reports and reviewing information. And then we have virtual sittings of the House uh, on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. We have caucus meetings uh, you know, within the party itself as well that are daily. And so, and they were seven days a week, just up until very recently, where we're now they're uh, five days a week. Um, it's uh, it's like we're doing the all of the things we would normally do when we go to Parliament Hill uh, while we're in the constituency now, which normally they're separate. You know, we spend one week uh, in the constituency doing constituency work, and then two or three weeks in in Ottawa uh, doing our legislative work. And they're kind of separate, so they don't overlap as much. And now we're really doing those, and then we're responding to the many concerns that are uh, that are out there today. So I think there's just a massive influx of that constituency work. So I would consider it almost triple duty. Uh, but you're doing it with pride, and you're doing it with a smile on your face too, which I know your constituents really appreciate. So Wednesday, May 13th, we are taping this. Uh, you know, news this morning comes that uh, the government is considering an extended border closure um, with the U.S. A good idea in your mind? I think uh, I think we we always need to uh, weigh these decisions out. I think uh, one thing I've been really impressed by by my caucus colleagues is and, and the ministers and cabinet ministers and even the prime minister when I've gotten the chance to talk to him is I 
really feel like we're weighing these decisions uh, and considering uh, all of the information and perspectives before making decisions, which I believe is is good leadership. It's uh, it's how good decisions or the best possible decisions are made in these types of uh, uh, situations. Um, border closures are not something we take lightly. Um, obviously, non-essential travel is something that we've had, um, um, you know, basically restricted significantly. Uh, for um, over six weeks now, I believe. And uh, I believe that will continue. Um, I think it should continue. Um, but I think, um, you know, we need to make these decisions with all of the information at our fingertips. I think the, uh, you know, border closures uh, are essential, um, you know, tools as a public health measure to control the, the spread and transmission of this virus. And we need to continue to stay vigilant at this time to protect people's health and safety, which should be our top priority at all times. Some people uh, would say that uh, we should have moved more quickly to, to close the border with the U.S. and non-essential travel, given yeah. what we know now. Yeah, I understand that. And, you know, I mean, obviously hindsight is always 2020. Uh, we all, um, it's it's very easy, I think, to, to claim that we could have, should have uh, moved faster. Um, I think, uh, I th well, it, from my perspective, I think we moved as fast as we could uh, with the information that we had at the time. And I believe that we moved quite quickly. Uh, there were many things and decisions that were made in, just a record-breaking amount of time. I've never seen government move so fast and be so responsive. Uh, so I've been really impressed by how quickly our government has responded to this. Um, I think the prime minister has said, and I agree with this, that you know we'll we'll have time for reflection when this is over to say what could we have done better. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how much we can learn from from this pandemic so that we can improve the way that we respond in the future. And I think that's uh, our responsibility is to is to consider those perspectives and, and make sure that we're responding as quickly and as effectively as possible uh, in the future. Okay, we only have about actually 30 seconds, 30 seconds left before we have to go to, to break. Um, but talking about moving quickly, one thing I think the government did move very quickly on was CERB. Um, your feedback on how that's been working. Well, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's not perfect, um, but wow, did we ever move quickly on it? Um, uh, again, we designed and rolled out a measure that supported people. Seven point three million people across Canada have accessed this support of two thousand dollars a month uh, direct uh, from the government, and uh, and we implemented that in less than two weeks. Um, it's incredible. I've never seen government move so quickly in my entire life. Uh, it's quite inspiring to see. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. We're going to go to a quick break. More of our conversation with MP Ryan Turnbull after the break. Securing your recycling in a few steps is simple, like crushing your cans and bottles down in your container's blue box and your box board down in your paper's box. This saves a lot of space and reduces the possibility of material blowing out of your blue box on windy days. I joined because I wanted to help others. To be a part of something bigger. To show my kids what's important. I joined to make my community stronger. To make a difference in someone's life. To acknowledge that our freedoms come at a cost. I joined to honor my mom, my grandpa, my neighbor, everyone who served, who are serving still. I joined. I joined. I joined the Legion. I want you to help me. Just give up on the people you love. Game's not over. Buckle up. Ooh. New to Rogers TV this fall, Animal Companions with Sharon Lindsay. Tune in to get the information you need to care for your best friend. That's Animal Companions with Sharon Lindsay, only on Rogers TV. We 
are back. Our guest on Talk Politics this week is Whitby MP Ryan Turnbull. Ryan, when we went to break, we were talking about the CERB, uh, I guess, and the speed that the government had, had rolled it out. Um, mm -hmm. There have been, I guess, some concerns with um, those who are either self-employed or who didn't meet the, um, I guess, the, the $5,000 earnings to qualify that are falling through the cracks. Um, what can you say to address that? Well, um, the uh, the CERB was designed uh, to support people that lost a significant amount of income uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, you know, just based on how many people have accessed it, it's really helped a large number or the vast majority of people that needed that support. There are uh, gaps uh, that we've uh, identified. I've advocated for uh, measures and uh, some changes to the eligibility criteria, in particular the $5,000 of income over the last 12 months. Uh, one of the changes that was made early on was that it does uh, apply to self-employed people. So people can count dividends or taking a draw from a company um, so multiple ways that self-employed people compensate themselves other than salary uh, can count towards the eligibility criteria for accessing the CERB. Uh, people can also, we did make a change to it uh, fairly early on, which was that based on what we heard, that some self-employed people were still able to work uh, a small amount of hours uh, per month. And so we uh, allowed them to earn up to $1,000 uh, before jeopardizing their uh, their eligibility for the CERB. So effectively, you can get $2,000 from the federal government uh, as a self-employed person, no matter how you compensate yourself, uh, and, um, and still earn up to $1,000 a month. So I think that's a pretty uh, good measure. It's uh, responsive, and I think it served the majority of, of people out there that, that needed it. Uh, we've also heard recently of some concerns. You know, those that... Um, are on Ontario Works or ODSP, which is, of course is a provincial benefit um, that have lost uh, their partial employment uh, due to COVID-19. Um, they're receiving CERB, but they're also afraid that they're going to have to pay a lot of it back when this is over. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, uh, you know, CERB is a taxable benefit. Um, we designed it through a very simple sort of three-part attestation process. So it could be administered very quickly. So this means that people, people can access it easily uh, and get a check within three to 10 business days. Uh, most checks that I've heard of, people have applied in 15 minutes and gotten a check three days later. Mm -hmm. So it's quite easy to access. Uh, this has some downfall uh, or, or some downside to it, which is that people can accidentally even take advantage of it. Um, uh, the, it is a taxable benefit, people should know, and uh, the provincial government, from my perspective, I believe is committed not to claw back uh, ODSP or OW, um, and I believe that that makes a lot of sense given that they administer uh, that social assistance. Um, but that remains to be seen. I, I haven't. Uh, I don't have enough information on uh, the provincial programs because I've been so focused on the many, many federal announcements that we've been making. Let's talk about uh, business relief. Uh, new measures recently announced uh, to help businesses. A lot of concern out there by by businesses who are not keeping their head above water. Yeah, it's difficult times if you're uh, if you're in business. Uh, small businesses, uh, in particular, I think are vulnerable. Uh, not to say that uh, larger businesses are not as well, but I think uh, many of the small businesses uh, that I've talked to, and I've talked to many, many in in the riding in Whitby, um, you know, they're they're experiencing uh, significant declines in their revenues, uh, and in many cases, their expenses uh, are fairly static or, or fixed. Um, the, the major, um, I think, supports that we've provided uh, are on multiple fronts. So I'll describe these briefly and, and try to keep it brief because there's really a lot. It's the biggest economic response in, in federal government history and the entire history of the Canadian economy. So it's, it's hard to sum up in, uh, in 30 seconds or less. But essentially, we've, uh, we've offered the Canada Emergency Business Account, which is $40,000 
uh, interest-free loans that are partially forgivable if people pay them uh, back within two years. Um, that's a real help for cash flow issues that small businesses are having. Uh, the other major support that I would say is, is really significant is the wage subsidy. Uh, so we've offered, um, th well, we identified early on that, uh, that the CERB did not encourage necessarily people to uh, stay in a way attached to their employer. Uh, and we wanted to uh, make sure that they, that they, that they stayed employed uh, as long as possible. Uh, or that employers could hire their employees back uh, as they move forward to economic recovery. Um, the wage subsidy provides 75% of an employee's wages. Uh, it's designed specifically for small to medium-sized enterprises. Uh, so your payroll has to be between 20,000 and 1.5 million. Uh, and uh, essentially it applies to as many, it's an unlimited number of employees. So essentially the federal government is offering to pay 75% of those employees' wages in a time where they may not have uh, a full amount of work to do. So I think this is significant. Um, it's a real benefit for many businesses. Um, the other that I'd say that I, I advocated very strongly for uh, with the Minister of Finance and uh, our provincial, my provincial, provincial counterparts, uh, as well as uh, the Prime Minister himself. I had a long conversation with him about commercial rent assistance. Um, I was happy to see that the, the federal government and provincial territorial governments were able to announce and launch a program. It is administered through CMHC and it provides um, up to 75% of rent relief to small businesses. So if you think of small businesses, Deborah, as having two main expenses for the most part, their staffing costs or their labor and their fixed cost uh, for overhead, which the vast majority of which is their rent uh, in many cases. Uh, the, both of these um, uh, costs are essentially being supported by the federal government right now. And then there's these cash flow uh, loans uh, that can help people um, get through the cash crunch uh, of this uh, crisis. Uh, let's also talk about uh, help recently announced for seniors, our most vulnerable uh, population. Mm -hmm. uh, seniors are uh, extremely vulnerable at a time like this from a health uh, perspective. So we know that uh, many of them are um, experiencing anxiety. Uh, the, also, many of them are on fixed incomes, mm -hmm. uh, and there is some uh, added expense right now. There's uh, some dispensing fees for prescriptions. There's some uh, food delivery costs, and some of the food prices have gone up slightly. So, you know, there is some additional pressure that they're experiencing, and I think our government recognizes that. There's also a significant downturn in the market, so anybody that has uh, retirement savings is uh, experiencing uh, stresses and pressures there. So this is why we reduced uh, the minimum withdrawals uh, for RIFs and, uh, and we're looking at other uh, measures uh, around ensuring that um, uh, Canadians that have retirement savings are able to, to you know, protect that saving, those savings. Um, but in terms of financial support, um, we, we've just recently announced, uh, in addition to um, some things that we announced before, i.e. the GST, HST uh, credit, which was doubled, um, we've announced uh, a one-time increase to OAS and, and the GIS. So it's, if you're eligible for both of those, it's up to $500 uh, extra check. It's a one-time payment. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, this helps seniors out at this time. You've, uh, you've had a couple of, of virtual town halls, um, and I was interested in, in one of the last ones that you had. Um, you were talking about helping reunite families and that, you know, there are still some Canadians that are stranded overseas, and you've, you've had to do a lot of work to, to bring their loved ones home. Still Canadians stranded overseas, really, at this point? Um, there are, yeah, we're still getting uh, some of those cases. It's much, much less than what it was. Um, but uh, if you can just imagine having um, over, I believe, a million uh, Canadians that are traveling at any given time, mm -hmm. um, you know, when the border restrictions were put in place, what we had is 
you know, many other countries also restricting their borders and uh, going into lockdown uh, for this pandemic in terms of their response. So, um, and many countries manage that differently. So in some cases, uh, we had families, I had a mother and, and her two daughters uh, that called um, from Guatemala and they were stuck in a uh, in an Airbnb. The airport was locked down. Military was in the streets, and essentially, no one was allowed to go out into the streets. Um, the the challenges of actually getting people home uh, and hearing the stories and the fear uh, and anxiety that they were experiencing stuck in another country, uh, where where they have no access to healthcare, uh, where their travel insurance may not apply, and no way to get home, was heartbreaking. We got many of those families home and through a very complex process of dealing with uh, through uh, Global Affairs Canada and working very closely with them. So I would work with the constituent uh, who's stranded. I would talk to them on the phone, gather all of the intel and information that we needed. They had to register online for Canadians overseas. Uh, we had to request consular support. And then they had to go through a whole series of approvals and often get uh, chartered flights uh, with the airlines and special permission to actually fly out of those countries to get Canadians home. It's remarkable how many tens of thousands of Canadians uh, we actually got home. And Global Affairs Canada did just an incredible job. I honestly, uh, I've never seen a group of people work harder and, and we did a you know, we played a small role, really, in, in the grand scheme of things, but uh, I have many, many um, constituents that, uh, that we helped to get home, and I'm very proud that, uh, that, they're, that they were able to get home to their families, um, or in some cases, get their whole family home. <laughs> and I'll bet you kissing the ground that they're walking on now. Did you hear, have you heard back from them since they landed? And we got now. many, many, many very lengthy and heartfelt thank you letters, and it was really touching uh, and inspiring. You know, as an MP, uh, you know, recently elected, I only got into this to really make a difference, and it's small uh, wins like that for real people that are tangible uh, for them in their lives that really inspire me to keep going. Okay, so and great. on that, sir, I have to stop us. We're out of time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all you do. Until next time, I'm Deborah Hutchison. Stay home, stay safe. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Anything at all. He's that strong. Joe Schuster, will you stop it or you'll miss your train? Now help me find number five. Strong, but by day he's a mild mannered reporter. Glasses, you know, a secret identity. Honestly, you Canadian kids. He'd be in this cape. A what? A cape. Wearing these blue tights. A hero in tights, really. Here it is. Listen, Lois, this guy is faster than anything, I swear. If you're not fast, you're going to miss your train. That's it. A bullet. A bullet. He's faster? No, he's faster than a speeding bullet. Come on, get on it. No one's going to read a comic strip about a strong man in tights, Joe. It'll never fly. Fly, no. But he can leap over tall buildings. Oh, wow, man. Yeah. See what your cousin Frank says in Toronto. Wait, wait, Lois. I I've got something for you. Take it. It's a gift. You never know. It might be worth something someday. Is he great or what? Bye-bye, Lois. Sometimes... For a wish to come true, it takes a kingdom because together is stronger.